It's time for Wall of Chefs, where amateur cooks crave culinary glory. Oh, baby. And are put to the ultimate test, competing in front of their kitchen idols. Cook properly. Four home cooks are about to compete in three intense rounds of culinary competition. Come on, guys. Judging them is the wall. Stacked with the country's most iconic chefs. Boom. <laughs> After each challenge, one cook is eliminated. In the end, the wall declares the winner of the $10,000 prize. Am I on the right track? Who will crumble under the pressure? Get it together, Ellie. And who will rise to the top? Hey, I'm Noah Kath, and this is Wall of Chefs. Have you ever asked yourself, do I have what it takes to compete in front of the very best? Well, four home cooks are about to find out, and one will walk away with $10,000. Let's meet the competitors. Marketing director by trade and practical joker in spirit, Josh Allen. I found that I love cooking well into my 30s. I started playing in different cuisines, different styles, and now I really enjoy cooking for family and friends. But today, i got to up my game because I know that the wall is going to be watching. Dance teacher and proudly plant-based, Ellie Hadley. I've always been in the kitchen. My family's always had big roast dinners at home, but I started experimenting with plant-based dishes for my health, and I realized I really enjoy cooking vegetables. If you treat your vegetables in a similar way to how you treat meat, you can be really satisfied and have a delicious meal. New mom and content creator, Preeti Ravi. My background in cooking is Indian. So it's a lot of bold flavors and spices. My one-year-old daughter has already tasted a lot of Indian curries and she loves it. I'm ready to cook my heart out. I'm ready to show the chefs what I'm made of. I'm just beyond excited. Former hockey player turned finance guy, Michael Campoli. I've been playing hockey probably since I was five. I find hockey and cooking similar because they kind of force you to be able to multitask. They force you to deal with a lot of pressure and kind of keep moving. I've been a competitor my whole life, so I'm definitely here to win. I did not come here to lose. Ellie, Josh, Preeti, Michael, are you ready to face the wall? Yes, yes. This is your wall of chefs. Mark McEwen, Krista Bruno Gunther, J. Anthony Dugan, Christine Cushing, Rob Feeney, Joel Watanabe, Lynn Crawford, Dale McKay, Suzanne Barr, Todd Perrin, Nui Regular, and Massimo Capra. Mamma mia. Home cooks, let's not keep the wall waiting. It's time for your first challenge. Okay. You all have that one special dish, the one that gets people talking, saying things like, you know, you should really apply for Wall of Chefs. In this round, you'll be making your crowd pleaser. This is your chance to show the Wall of Chefs what you can dish out in the kitchen. Are you ready to cook for the very best? Yes. Born ready. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You have 30 minutes on the clock, and your cook starts now. All right! Yeah. Go, go, Let's go! go. I think I got everything. All right, let's see. I'm going to try to make the most of this. I don't usually get to cook in front of a wall of culinary icons, so this is cool. For my crowd pleaser, I'm gonna be making a steak frit with a Bernays sauce. For me, this is a dish that I fell in love with on a trip with my family to France. It shows off technique, but it's comfort food because it's still French fries and steak at the end of the day. Okay, okay. Michael has really good skills. He knows how to handle a knife. You can see he's a guy who played sports like at a high level like that. Yeah. He's used to being coached. He's used yeah. to knowing, okay, we gotta do this, yeah. this, yeah. this. 
To prep the potatoes, I'm gonna blanch them in hot boiling water so that when you put them in the oil, they're pretty much already cooked. All you have to do is bring them to really high temperature. They set a timer, like he's clearly got a plan. Hello, Preeti. Hi. How are you? Good. What is your crowd pleaser? My crowd pleaser is a chicken tikka masala mm. with some rice and pickled onions. Beautiful. Yeah. This is one of those dishes that even if people aren't familiar with these flavors, yeah. it's a hit. It's a hit. A chicken tikka is traditionally cooked in a hot tandoor, but obviously we can't do that because we don't have tandoors in our home. So I'm going to use a blowtorch to heat up the charcoal. Once it starts burning, I'm going to pour some clarified butter over it and I'm going to cover it with a lid. I've never seen that before. I love the technique. This way you get some smoky flavor yeah, in there. Yeah, and then you get like then, a real char. Yeah. That's cool. Hello, Ellie. Hi. What is your crowd pleaser? Uh, I'm making eggplant parmesan. My late mother-in-law made chicken palm for me, and when I went plant-based, I switched it to eggplant. Excellent. Truly, I am a big, huge fan of anything plant-based. For part of my dish, I'm making a red wine tomato sauce. Ellie elected to make a sauce that would take normally two, three hours cooking at very low temperature. So very difficult, but it's not impossible, and it can be done definitely. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. Today, I'm making crispy skinned chicken thigh over jasmine rice along with quick pickled cucumbers. This is a dish I know inside and out. Now, doing it inside of 30 minutes, that's going to be an interesting challenge. All right. What's the key to getting a good crispy chicken skin? Just let it sit in the pan, skin side down, let the fat render out, and as it cooks, it just magically crisps up, and it's sensational. Looking good. We've just passed the 20-minute mark, home cooks. With my steak, I'm making Bernays sauce. Bernays sauce is a more rich hollandaise sauce with tarragon. He's making Bernays sauce. He's doing it. Fantastic. Why the glow? Why, what got you excited there? Because it shows you know how to handle things. You have to whip the eggs properly. You have to have it at the right temperature. I couldn't help but notice Michael's got his yolks in the blender. Well, it's not how I do it. I do it in a stainless steel bowl over live flame. But as a way to shortcut in a, in a competition? Yeah, it's the same sauce. thing, yeah. Old school doesn't like it. You guys are like, play the claw. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the blender is the quick, fast way to still produce a beautiful sauce. We're good here. My chicken is smoked, and I can chuck it in the oven, and I move on to my next step, which is making my cashew and onion paste for the base of my curry. Anytime you're doing anything that has to do with, like, curry, the flavors have to hit 100%. A lot of seasoning. A lot, lot of flavors. seasoning. Uh, a little bit of spice. I never measure my spices. I usually just cook by instinct, see what happens. Ugh, that's a lot of nutritional yeast. <laughs> I have to set up my dredging station for the eggplant. Nutritional yeast is a powder. It's a really important part of the vegan dish because that's the parm. It has its own nutty flavor, it's similar to Parmesan, but it's not quite the same. Chef Capra, have you ever come across a vegan eggplant parmigiana? Never, because the cheese is essential in the, in the preparation of the dish. I put a little too much in there, maybe, but whatever. We'll just make it more cheesy. That's fine. <laughs> getting hungry now. <laughs> I know that my chicken is just about done, but the real problem is that rice. Come on. That seems to be cooked on the bottom, but not so cooked on the top. So I start to panic. Oh. Look at that. You take a second, make a crowd pleaser, and boom, one minute, 30 seconds. Look at that sheer. It looks pretty good from here, those steaks. He's like slap shot from center <laughs> ice, people. <laughs> Boom! I think the rice is done. Pretty start to play the rice. It looks beautiful. One minute, guys. You heard it from the wall. One minute remaining, home cooks. I think I'll be lucky if I manage to get my plates done, but we're working on it. I know I'm out of time, and I've got to put the rice down first and on the plate. I don't feel that it's fully cooked, but I've got to go with it. Oh, boy. Let's go, Let's go guys. Come on. Bring it, bring it, bring it. We're going to do a countdown in five, four, three, two, one. Hands up. Yeah. Hands up, home folks. Congratulations. That's your first round.
home cooks, it's time to face the wall. Here are the four chefs judging your crowd pleasers. Owner of Vancouver's Kisa Tonto, marrying Japanese and Italian cuisine, Chef Joel Watanabe. Co-owner of Pie and Kin, and Canada's leading chef in traditional and royal Thai cuisine, Chef Nui Regular. Culinary legend, cookbook author, and Food Network Canada personality, Chef Lynn Crawford. Owner of Saskatchewan's Aiden Kitchen and Bar, Avenue, and Little Grouse on the Prairie, Chef Dale McKay. Ellie, Josh, Preeti, Michael. You've made your crowd pleasers. Now, let's see if they please this crowd. Josh. I'm not feeling 100% confident in my dish. I know that the rice isn't cooked. And I'm thinking, is this going to work out well? Josh, tell us about your crowd pleaser. So chefs, I've made for you a crispy skinned chicken thigh with garlic and ginger infused teriyaki sauce over jasmine rice finished with scallions, black and white toasted sesame seeds. The bowl was quite beautiful actually, very simple. The chicken was cooked well, had a nice crispy skin. Thought the sauce was good. I appreciate using both sesame seeds, black and white. I find that they have a different flavor and a little kind of pop. When you say jasmine rice, I say yes. Jasmine rice has a beautiful aroma. Now, the rice that you cooked, I feel like it's a little bit under. Maybe it would have been better to have kept the rice cooking just for another couple of minutes because it was probably the biggest miss on your dish. Thank you, Chef. Josh, you can head back to your station. All right, Ellie. Hi. I've made a vegan eggplant parmesan with red wine tomato sauce and spaghetti on the side. Ellie, it's a really Italian classic. To take a classic <laughs> and make it vegan, what a great idea that is. The Japanese eggplant, it's nice and tender. You get that nice crispy crust. Perhaps maybe a little bit more nutritional yeast would give more of that uh, parmesan taste to it. I would agree with uh, Chef Lynn about a little more nutritional yeast, just so that it kind of makes more of that cheesiness or that umami flavor. The texture of the crunchiness and the softness of the eggplant, it's just so perfect. The only thing that I would critic is the sauce. I find that the balance of the flavor is not that. A little bit more seasoning. Thank you. You can make your way back to your station. Michael. Today, I tried to take you on a little trip to your favorite French bistro and make a classic steak frit with a Bernays sauce. Hope you enjoy. The star on the plate for me is your Bernays sauce. So well seasoned, really spectacular. Thank you. Steak's cooked perfectly. You finished it with butter and herbs. I thought you pulled it off really, really well. Thank you. The execution of the steak was really good. Mine could have rested maybe just a little bit. It's kind of bleeding out on the plate, and the fries could have been cut a little more evenly. But the Bernays was fantastic, really good acid. It's a great job. Great job, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Preeti. Hi, chefs. Hi. Hi. So there is uh, a chicken tikka masala on a bed of green pea rice and topped up with some pickled onions. The smoking, it's really delicious. The chicken's really tender. The spices, sometimes in a short period of time, it's a little harder to get those flavors kind of into the chicken, but yeah. this was really good. But I thought the rice was maybe a touch under. The sauce is so beautiful. It's just so perfectly balanced that I have to close my eyes and enjoy the bite. Thank you. Really good balance. The chicken was cooked really, really well. I loved watching you cook. I think your smile is super infectious and, and it comes out in your, in your food as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chefs, you've now tasted all four crowd pleasers, so you can head back to the wall. Home cooks, it's time to find out which three of you will be moving on to the next round and who will be eliminated. 
Chefs, have you reached your decision? Yes, we have. Preeti, your chicken was cooked and seasoned beautifully, and we are very impressed with your technique. Congratulations, you had our favorite crowd pleaser, and you're moving on to the next round. Thank you so much. Michael, we really enjoyed your steak frites, and you're also moving on to the next round. Thank you. Ellie, Josh, that means one of you is moving forward in the competition, and one of you is heading home. Ellie, your eggplant had really nice crunch, but needed more nutritional yeast to give it that Parmesan flavor. Josh, your chicken was crispy, but your rice was a little undercooked. The home cook that's moving on to the next round is Josh. Ellie, the wall has spoken and you've been eliminated. Thank you. It's a pleasure to cook for you. Great job today. I'm feeling really disappointed just because I'm a perfectionist and I know I can do better. But even if one person thinks, hey, I want to try eggplant parm, then I've done my job and I'm happy. Josh, Preeti, Michael, congratulations. The three of you have survived the first round, and you're all now one step closer to the $10,000 grand prize. All right. Woohoo! In this next round, you'll be stepping inside the most revered place in a chef's kitchen their fridge. Home cooks. In this round, you'll be asked to create a dish using three ingredients that are staples in the home fridge of one of our chefs. Celebrating the flavors and spirit of her Métis culture, owner of Winnipeg's Feast Cafe and Bistro, Chef Krista Bruno Gunther. Hello, Noah. Hello, Chef. How are you? Good, thank you. Hello, home cooks. Chef. Hi. Chef Bruno Gunther, shall we show the home cooks the ingredients in your fridge? Let's do it. The three ingredients that I always have in my fridge are pine nuts, Swiss chard, and birch syrup. What is birch syrup? Birch syrup is indigenous to Canada. It was used among our ancestors in many dishes over the years. It's maple syrup's cousin. Birch syrup has big flavor and taste. It's a mix between toffee and brown sugar, but has some citrus notes to it. Pine nuts are the edible seeds of the pine tree. Pine nuts have a sweet, buttery texture and have a mild, nutty flavor. Swiss chard grows abundantly in my home garden, so it's always in my fridge. The leaves have a bitterness to them, but when you cook it, it gets really nice and sweet. Home cooks, in this challenge, you must create a dish that features all three ingredients from Chef Bruno Gunther's fridge. Remember, whoever makes the least impressive dish will be eliminated at the end of this round. You have 35 minutes on the clock, and your cook, it starts. Now. Woo. If there was an ingredient here that you thought might be a hurdle for some of these home cooks, what would it be? Birch syrup. A lot of people don't know it exists because maple syrup has been the star for so long. It's absolutely delicious. I can work with that. When I see pine nuts, I'm immediately thinking pesto. And if I put some Swiss chard into the pesto, boom, I've nailed two of these. Michael, let me officially introduce you to Chef Bruno Gunther. Hi, Chef. So tell me, how are you going to use the Swiss chard, the birch syrup, and the pine nuts today? For the Swiss chard, I'm going to make a pasta with the pesto. The pine nuts, I'm toasting. I'm going to incorporate these in the pesto. And for the birch, I think I'm going to saute some of the stalks in some birch with some citrus. And it's just a vegetarian dish? It's going to be a vegetarian dish, yeah. Sounds yeah. like you've got a plan. Thank you. I'm thinking pasta to cook is not going to take super long, so my focus is get the pesto, make it perfect. I'm going to add sun-dried tomatoes, Parmesan cheese, basil, and toasted pine nuts. Hi, Josh. Hello. What are you making today? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the uh, chard in a pesto 
I'm gonna make double cut lamb, and I'm gonna use the birch syrup as part of a glaze for some oven roasted potatoes. Are there any ingredients here that you're unfamiliar with or you're a little bit worried about? Uh, really just the birch syrup, right? Give it a taste, it's kind of molasses-y a little bit. I'm gonna figure out if there's a way to maybe temper some of that. Well, it sounds like you're almost there. You got Am a plan. Am I on the right track? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks, Josh. guys. Thank you. Hello, Pretty. What are you making with my three fridge ingredients? Uh, I'm gonna make a pasta. Well, I'm gonna make a pesto with the Swiss chard and the pine nuts. Everybody's doing a pesto. I'm also gonna marinate my prawns in the birch syrup. I've tasted it, it's, it's quite nice. So the prawns need to sit in the marinade for some time so that it can nicely soak up all the flavors. Next, I'm gonna make the pesto. I think everybody is making pesto, so I think it's going to be a battle of the pestos. Chef McEwen, all three of our home cooks, deciding to go with the pesto. Let's just break it down. How do you make a good one? Pesto is simple. Toasted pine nuts, fresh basil, olive oil, Parmesan cheese, and that's it. You want to keep it very, very simple. When blending, what's the consistency we're looking for in that blender? It should be a paste that holds around in a spoon, so it has body. Right. Get some olive oil, some more liquid, put some lemon juice. There you go. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Go, 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 I want my pesto to be a little more creamy. I'm going to add cream, and I'm going to hope for the best. 23 minutes and 30 seconds. This clock keeps on ticking. I'm happy with that. I got the pesto. I've got my birch syrup potatoes in the oven. Next, I'm going to grill this lamb. I see that the lamb is on the grill, but it's 20 minutes to go. You're worried about the uh, time? Yeah, it has to cook it properly and then wrap it up. Let the rest, you know what I mean? A lot of the fat was left on it. If you're gonna cook it that style, I would most likely just make it a one bone chop rather than a two bone chop and not have to deal with all that fat that's kind of encased it. You know, home cooks get from A to B different ways. Absolutely. And the result sometimes works. Yep. Shockingly. <laughs> nice. Pesto's taking a lot of the clock. It took a lot of time with the pesto. I'm feeling worried because I don't think I have enough time to cook this pasta properly. I'm using a cavatelli pasta. It's really thick, so this is gonna be tight. There's only a couple moments left and I'm feeling a little bit stressed because I'm worried about my pasta being undercooked. If this is undercooked, I could be going home. Two pastas with pesto. Mm, well, that'll be a good that comparison. Gonna be, yeah. How is the birch syrup going to be on a pasta? That's my problem. Well, that's why she's got the shrimp. Well, she marinated so... the shrimp with yeah. it. Yeah. I'm ready to start searing my shrimp on the pan. These shrimp have to taste like birch syrup. Otherwise, I'm not going to win this challenge. I have no idea where I'm going to land with my lamb. I've got one piece that's yay thick, and it's super underdone. I've got another piece like that, and it's way overcooked. And I've got five minutes left. This guy's done, and this guy's done. It's stressful. Three minutes, 30 seconds, home cooks. You've got time, but use it wisely. I got to make sure that I have enough birch syrup in my dish. I love having breadcrumb toppings on my pastas. It adds a great crunch. So I take breadcrumbs with some olive oil, some garlic powder, some lemon zest, and the birch syrup. I've made breadcrumb toppings for pastas, but I've never added anything sweet into it. I don't know how it's going to turn out. 30 seconds, home cooks. Let's go. 30 seconds. Go, 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 go. The battle of the pestos. <laughs> Wall, let's bring it home. Five, four, three, two, one. Hands up. <laughs> Nicely done. That's a heck of a job, home cooks. I'm feeling confident about the flavors, but whose pesto is the best, though? Home cooks, it's time to face the wall. In addition to Chef Bruno Gunther, here are your judges for this round. 
He's the owner of the McEwen Group and a Canadian culinary icon, Chef Mark McEwen, bringing creative classics to Canada's West Coast. Chef Rob Feeney, author, social advocate, and CEO of Suzanne Bar Food, Chef Suzanne Bar. Home cooks, let's see what you made with Swiss chard, pine nuts, and birch syrup. Michael? Chefs, for you today, I made a cavatelli pasta with sun-dried tomato pesto using the Swiss chard and the pine nuts, as well as some sautéed Swiss chard stalks. And the final component on this dish is a birch syrup topping with some breadcrumbs and pine nuts. I absolutely love this dish. It is so delicious. The crumble is lovely. It's a bit sweet, so definitely adding that lemon zest cuts through that. The little bits of that Swiss chard that you sauteed, I love that little bit of crunch. Thank you for honoring those ingredients today, Miigwech. <laughs> Thank you, Chef. The flavor is there, but I think the pasta could have stayed in the water a minute and a half more. Yeah. This is a very thick pasta. You just have to be careful of it. The crumble, I really liked it. The birch syrup with the breadcrumbs and then the pine nuts create this sort of wonderful texture. And with the pesto, the bitterness comes out in terms of the Swiss. You manage to get all three ingredients in this dish. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, Preeti. So I've made for you a prawn pesto pasta. I use the Swiss shards and I also use the pine nuts to make the pesto. And I glaze the prawns with the birch syrup. You know, I was really excited to see this large prawn at the top, and I love the idea that you use that birch syrup on it. And the prawns were really nicely cooked. As soon as you put this bowl down, the beautiful green color, it's gorgeous. The pasta's cooked perfectly, but I think some of the pesto separated from adding the cream. I'm just finding the pesto a bit watery, and watered down, at least for me, the flavor of the Swiss chard. I can't taste it very much. Okay. Thank you, Preeti. You can head back. Thank you. Josh. All right, so chefs, what you have in front of you is a lamb chop glazed in the birch syrup. There's a pesto where I've used the pine nuts as well as the birch syrup and the chard. And the potatoes were glazed in birch syrup. I love the cook on the lamb. I love that there was the pesto on top. The only thing I would say is there's a lot of garlic, so I think it washed out the taste of the Swiss chard. The two ingredients that really stood out on the plate for me were the pine nuts and the birch syrup. The Swiss chard, not so much. Almost feels absent on the plate for me. If you'd had a nice pile of beautifully sauteed Swiss chard on the bottom of that lamb, it would have made a huge difference on the plate. Thank you, Chef. I do like the potatoes. The birch syrup on there has that little bit of citrus and sweet. I love the pesto and I taste the pine nuts. I could have just used a little bit more. So miigwech. Thank you, Chef. Chefs, you've now had a chance to taste all three dishes, so I'll ask you to make your way back up to the wall. And home cooks, it's now time to find out which two of you will be moving on to the final round and who will be eliminated. Chefs, have you made your decision? Yes, we have. Michael, the crumble on your pesto pasta was a standout. Congratulations. You made our favorite dish of the challenge. And you're moving on to the final round. Thank you. That means Preeti and Josh. One of you is moving on to the final round, and one of you will be eliminated. Preeti and Josh. One of you is moving on to the final round, and one of you will be eliminated. Preeti, your dish was bright and beautiful, but you missed the mark on your pesto. Josh, your lamb was cooked perfectly, but we were missing the Swiss chard on your plate. Josh, you are safe. Preeti, the wall is spoken and you have been eliminated. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such an honor to cook for all of you. I had a really lovely time. All the best, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. 
I'm really happy that I came this far in the competition. Being here and the chefs tasting my food has been such a pleasure. I'm going to remember this day. Josh and Michael, congratulations. You've made it to the final round. At the end of this cook, the wall will declare one of you the winner, and you'll walk away with $10,000. Right here. For your final challenge, you'll take inspiration from one of our chefs to create a restaurant-worthy dish. He's a cookbook author and the owner of Capra's Kitchen, Chef Massimo Capra. Massimo Capra is a guy I grew up watching on TV. He's an Italian, I'm Italian. I'm hoping his dish is Italian so that I can cook something in my wheelhouse. Chef. Hello, Noah. Home cooks. Chef. Chef. It's really him. <laughs> <laughs> With the mustache and all. Yeah, it's real, too. Look at this. Papity poopy. <laughs> All right, Chef Capra, should we take a look at what you brought us? Let's go. This is my famous beet risotto. This risotto was a staple on my menu at Mistura for 20 years. The beets provide a beautifully sweet flavor, all the while maintaining the integrity of a perfect risotto. Every good chef knows that people eat with their eyes first. Adding color to your plate, it's a great way to make a memorable dining experience. Home cooks, you've now seen Chef Capra's beet risotto. For your final challenge, you'll have to create your own restaurant-worthy dish that is colorful and eye-catching. There's $10,000 on the line, 35 minutes on the clock, and your cook starts now. Yay. Yay. Come on, guys. Watermelon. Got it. Chef Capra, what are some ingredients that our home cooks could reach for that'll help add color? Well, uh, vegetables, radishes, leafy greens, uh, anything that has a little bit of spark to it. And both scallops, or? Is that tuna? Yeah, yeah it's tuna. I think they're both making a raw dish. Yeah. Under the gun. This is for all the marbles. I'm making a scallop crudo. Scallops are white, so it's a kind of a blank canvas to add a lot of color on the plate. And because I'm doing a crudo, I don't have to cook the scallops. I'm just marinating them with a simple lemon juice and salt. That's smart. Right away, my mind yeah. is like crudo. Yeah, that's a good idea. You got to nail it, though. Hello, Michael. How's it going? What are we looking at? I'm making a little scallop crudo with a bunch of beautiful colored radishes, cucumber, zucchini, salad on top. OK. And I'm going to make a puree. It's going to be a citrus puree, as well as some crispy chicken skins. Make sure the chicken skin there is extra one for me. <laughs> extra. Thank you. Michael, <laughs> one more question. Oh, what? what? Hey, Mike, he's, he's a man Michael. on a mission. <laughs> he's like, got to go, chef. <laughs> I love that. Whew. Josh, let me introduce you to Chef Capra. Hello, Chef Capra. How do you do, Josh? See some tuna over there, some watermelon. Yeah. What are you going to do? So what I'm doing is uh, I'm taking the concept of a tuna poke bowl. My thought is to take all of the colorful things that I enjoy, put them all together on one plate, and see where I land. But don't concentrate only on color. Taste is also very important. I'll keep that in mind. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Why is he cutting his avocado already? Yeah. No. The chef Bart concerned about Josh potentially cutting into that avocado too early. What's going to happen to it? It will turn brown <laughs> and it's going to go mushy. You want it to still have the defined shape of all the ingredients within that poke bowl. We're going to find out. Putting all the pieces together. Chefs, what's the difference between a crudo and a poke? Crudo is generally sliced thin done with uh, citrus and a little bit of an oil, and poke is pretty much the same, but generally have it a little bit more cubed. Yeah, and poke tends to be dressed a little heavier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where a crudo, the less you do to it, the better. One thing about both dishes, too, is that there's nowhere to hide. It's going to come down to that dressing. If there's not enough acidity, if the dressing is not punchy enough, it's going to be bland and it's going to be boring. Oh, yeah. All or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of finale I like. Under control, I think. I'm making a citrus puree that's going to act as a brightness and flavorful component to add to the scallops. C'est ma pièce de résistance. 
I'm adding cilantro to my puree because it adds another color dimension. And then I'm trying to make it thick and rich emulsion so that it stays in its spot on the plate. It's a little thinner than I would like. I realize that it's not thickening up. This is a major issue. I need to get moving. I need to make a rich emulsion, and I realize that it's not thickening up. It's a little thinner than I would like. That's really good. It's not perfect, but it tastes really good, and I've used too much time on the sauce, so I need to move on. 15 minutes to go. It's getting there. Chef Watanabe, we have a poke bowl at Josh's station, which originates from Hawaii. What's the most important component of a poke bowl? Probably comes down to the cut of the fish. I lived in Hawaii for a little while. And often it was more sliced across the grain. And the problem with big cubes, depending on where you are in the tuna, you may end up with, with a very large slab of sinew, which becomes very chewy and hard to eat. Hopefully that's not too much or too little. Usually I don't cook for presentation. I usually try to focus on flavor. So this is a step out of my comfort zone. That's beautiful. He knows what he's doing. Look at his technique. I think I need to take my polka bowl to the next level with a sauce. There we go. I'm adding in some orange marmalade, and I add in some sriracha. I have no idea what he put. The poke bowl is becoming strange. Yep. We've got five minutes to go. I'm taking a lot of time on plating the salad, and this is not looking as well as I wanted to. <sighs> Come on, fish. I got my marmalade down on the plate. Then I'm looking at my tuna thinking, it ain't so uniform. I need to make sure that the cubes I'm putting down are the most uniform cubes that I have, because there's $10,000 on the line. Come on, come on, come on. Quick, get the dressing on. Every plate's got to have sauce. Crispy shallots. Josh, going to the pantry. Got it. Just a heads up in there, Josh. 20 seconds. That's all I need. Oh, my gosh. He's going to like, you got to hurry. Laser focus. Look those plates over. Oh. Wall, help me count it down. Five, four, three, two, one. Nine. That's time. Hands up. <sighs> Home cooks. It's time to face the wall. In addition to Chef Capra, here are your final round judges. She's been fearless in the kitchen for more than 20 years. Award-winning cookbook author, Chef Christine Cushing. Owner of Montreal's pan-Caribbean eatery, Tropical, Chef J. Anthony Dugan. He's making Newfoundland and Labrador a culinary destination. Chef Todd Perrin. Josh. So chefs, first thing that popped in my head was like a polka bowl. So I came up with a sriracha marmalade. I've got some pomegranate in there, some crispy shallots. I hope uh, you enjoy it. Josh. The look of it looks really good. You know, with a lot of multitude of colors, with a lot of elements in it. When I saw you putting sriracha in the marmalade, I thought really an odd thing to put in that. But when you drag it through the whole dish and you pick it up and you get a nice spoonful, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, chef. I thought that tuna, your marmalade, it actually really worked well for me. A Couple of things, your avocados are going a little brown. You kind of, you, that was like the first thing that you chopped up. So you could have did that kind of last at the end. Everything that Chef wanted, you captured on this plate. It's extremely colorful. It reminds me of the Caribbean, actually. The flavor is there. It was sweet, salty. And I like that you had texture. It came together very well. Thank you, Chef. The tuna, uh, because it's completely raw, in something like this, the knife work really is everything. You really have to slice it very delicately so we don't get any sinew, so we don't get that chewiness. It's perfect. Thank you, Chef. Josh, you can head back to your station. Michael, 
Just for you today, I made a sea scallop crudo with a rainbow salad of seasonal radishes, cucumbers, and zucchini with citrus puree and crispy chicken skin crumble on the top. Michael, the scallops. You did a fantastic job because they taste great and the dressing is really good. The level of acidity in there is just perfect for this dish. From a, you know, did you meet the challenge perspective? You went totally the opposite of Josh. You went a little bit more subtle, but I still consider this a colorful dish. The one thing I have to say is I would have preferred to have more dressing on the, the scallops themselves. The sauce was the star for me, for sure. And I think if you had tossed the scallops into that sauce, it would have really made a big difference. And, you know, it was a, not quite as colorful as your competitor's dish, but the chicken skin was a great addition. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. I'm definitely proud of myself. I gave it everything I had, so that's all I can really ask myself. It's in the judges' hands at this point. I know that Michael's got technique for days, but today I took some risks. So you know what? This could be closer than it may appear. Chefs, it's time to make a $10,000 decision. Who's it going to be, Michael or Josh? Josh is pretty fearless. He kind of seemed every challenge. He didn't back down. You could tell there was a ton of things going through his head. He tried new things, I think, out of his comfort zone. And I found that he got better each round. I think that Josh showed some really good technique as he progressed, and I thought that he persevered through some yeah. challenges. I quite enjoyed his last dish. I think Josh was slow and steady and maybe won the race. But Michael was a star today, too, and he is so young and to put out so many beautiful dishes, and he had so much technique. Michael brought it. He came with his game face on. He was very precise about what he wanted to accomplish. And he knew what he was doing with pairing things together and making sure that it was going to, one, look beautiful, but also taste good. Michael was so strategic in his planning. It's like he had already a mise en place in front of him. He already knew what he wanted to do. It was really a pleasure to watch him work. Chefs, have we reached a decision? Yes, we yes, have. All right, let's bring in the home cooks. Michael and Josh, it's time to find out who will be $10,000 richer. Michael, you are a man with a plan, displaying skill and technique in all of your dishes. Josh, you surprised the chefs with the risks that you took today and brought amazing enthusiasm to every round. There can only be one winner. Michael, you just won Wall of Chefs and $10,000. I just won $10,000 and I feel amazing. Cooking is so important to me and now I'm feeling I'm gonna take more risks at home and try things I've never tried before. The sky's the limit for what I'm gonna do in the kitchen. This has been an absolute honor to cook for you. I've enjoyed many meals in many of your restaurants. I was just here to try and get some of my money back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got to work on my technique, but my biggest takeaway is that I'm a pretty good cook. I just wanted to thank everyone here. It was an honor, it was a pleasure. One of the best days of my life. Thank you guys so much. Congratulations, Michael.